Welcome to the fifth annual Stump Entrepreneurship Lecture at Birmingham Southern College. I'm Dr. Sarah Robichaud. I'm the Director of the Entrepreneurship Program and the Dean of the Business Programs here at Birmingham Southern. And I'm very excited that we're on our fifth year of this lecture series. And um, in the past, we've had a number of wonderful speakers. Our first speaker was Jeff Taylor from Munster.com. Then we had Bill Ranzik, who was the winner of the Donald Print, uh, Trump Apprentice Show, <laughs> followed by Fred Smith, founder of FedEx, and Alex Friedman, who was the chief investment officer of UBS Wealth Management. Tonight, we have an extra special speaker who I'm super excited about that many of us personally know. And instead of me introducing him, I've decided that since the students, the students at BSC are closest to this individual that we're going to let the students introduce this speaker tonight. So I'm going to start by introducing one of our Stump Entrepreneurship Scholars and he's going to tell you a little bit about the entrepreneurship program and then he's going to introduce the other Stump Scholar who's going to introduce our speaker. So Sam Campbell, if you'll come forward, he's one of our freshman Stump Scholars. Thank you, Dr. Robichaud. Good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Campbell, and I'm a rising sophomore who serves as a Stump Scholar at Birmingham Southern College. This prestigious program is for students interested in business as a career and embodies the spirit of entrepreneurship in their lives. Thanks to the generosity of Jane and Kevin Stump, with support from an endowment established by Joseph S. Bruno, this fellowship is able to inspire resilience and creativity in the free enterprise system. Dr. Sarah Robichaud, Dr. Carolyn Garrity, and the student board lead the program. Would the Stump Scholars and Mr. and Mrs. Stump please rise to be recognized. Please join me in showing our appreciation for their services and contribution to our business. Stump scholars are matched with a mentor, an internship, and a faculty advisor. They are invited to guest speakers, and they are invited to interact with those guest speakers. This academic year, the scholars have used their talents to start their own student-led board, attend Alabama Launchpad, which they hope to participate in the near future, and establish their own Relay for Life team, netting over $1,515 for the American Cancer Society. The Stump Scholars will actually be completing their final final fundraiser at the Relay next Thursday at 6 p.m. on the quad, so please consider coming to cheer them and others on. Finally, if Ayn Rand's words, the ladder of success is best climbed on the rungs of opportunity ring true, then this program is a ladder that leads to the zenith of any career or ambition. All you have to do is climb the ladder. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Patrick Joyce. I'm a junior business major and a Stump Scholar. I have the privilege tonight to introduce a man with incredible amount of character and honor. While uh, serving as a senior leader of the Marine Corps, chairman and CEO of the MBNA Europe Bank in England, or BSC's president, I cannot think of a man who's made more of an impact everywhere he goes. He impacted my choice of college. When I was visiting on a tour, he jumped in front of our golf cart stopped us and demanded to meet everyone on board. Uh, you wouldn't let us go until you individually hand, uh, shook our hands. Um, if, I haven't, if you haven't had an experience like this, more than likely he's been at a sports game or he's been in the library with his uh, cart of cookies during finals week, offering encouraging words. His actions, big or small, leave an impact that will always be felt. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me or please join me in welcoming your 2015 stump speaker, General Charles Krulak. Thank you very much. Please, thank you very much. Thank you, gang. Thank you. Please, sit, sit down. Thank you. Now, let, me, uh, let me start by thanking Kevin and Jane Stump for sponsoring this remarkable program. 
your great people, your generosity, and your selflessness has been deeply appreciated. And on a personal note, I want to thank you for your friendship since the day we arrived here. It, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, you, you heard a little bit of my background, and, and along that path that I've taken, I've met some really great people, people who were professors in my life, who taught me, who showed me through their example the, the ideas of, of selflessness and honor and courage and commitment that were themselves uh, entrepreneurs in many ways, innovative, uh, visionaries, risk takers, and uh, are very special people. And a lot of what I'm going to say today was it, today is a result of what they taught me over the years. I would be remiss uh, at this time to not say a couple of words to those people who are not the seniors, because I'm going to have a chance to talk to the seniors uh, at graduation. But for the rest of you who are not seniors, this is probably the last time I'll be able to see you all together. And I just wanted to tell you what an honor it has been to serve as your president. Uh, you have brought a special light into my life, into my wife's life. You are precious grandchildren to us, and we're going to be there for you whenever you need it. Uh, my email address is not going to change much, so you'll be able to get a hold of me, and you can certainly friend me, uh, because as far as I'm concerned, you all are my friends. With that is kind of a an, an entree, let me, let me talk about uh, entrepreneurship. And let's start with the beginning, and we're going to define it for you. That's the definition of entrepreneurship. The first one, obviously, is uh, the one you normally think about. It's tied to money. Nothing wrong with that. Tied to money. The second one is more generic, and it talks about somebody who organizes and, and manages and assumes. Again, talking about businesses and enterprises. What I'd like to bring to your attention is the word risk. Each one of these has risk. It's found in both definitions. And in many ways, risk is the prime ingredient of entrepreneurship. You can have a great idea but if you aren't willing to risk, if you aren't willing to risk, you're not going to achieve your success. Now, that risk can take many, many fashions. And a great example would be the risk of, of reputation. Probably the worst risk you can have is your own reputational risk, that you do something to damage that. There can be monetary risk. There can be physical risk. There can be emotional risk strategic risk, all of those. Just know that risk normally pays off for you when the enterprise you're entering, whatever that is in your life, is well thought out, that you've taken a hard look at it, that you've understood the unintended consequences of your actions, the pros and cons of the endeavor. You do that and you risk chances are you're going to be remarkably successful. Understand that often the little corner here is going to be some failures. I mean, we all are going to fail when you take a risk, but if you do a good job of thinking it through, you're going to be very successful. Risk rarely pays off when it's not thought through. So now that we have a definition of risk, let's tackle the question of whether or not Entrepreneurs are born or made. It's the same question that we've been wrestling with regarding leadership. Are leaders born or are they made? My answer and the answer of this college and the answer of colleges and universities all across the nation are yes, in fact, leaders are made. I had the greatest professor of entrepreneurship you could ever imagine. And he was the greatest mentor you could ever imagine. Here he is. 
the brute. That's my dad. He passed away at the age of almost 96 years old. His nickname was Brute. I never heard my mom call him anything but Brute. Never. His mother called him Brute. We called him Sir. <laughs> As you can see by his visage, he is a pretty tough dude. Uh, if some of the students think I can get tough, this man was harder than woodpecker lips. <laughs> they made a movie and wrote a book called The Great Santini. Okay, well, he could have been the inspiration for it. But let me tell you, he had a 200-pound brain. A 200-pound brain. He was a visionary. He was a risk taker. And he was an entrepreneur. Let me give you a, a couple of examples because he, he was a, a great inspiration to me. In 1937, he was a first lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps, stationed as part of the international legation in Shanghai, China. The Imperial Japanese Army had just moved in to China and war clouds were forming all over the Far East. There were many people in uh, America, particularly in the military and in the highest levels of our government, that believed we would eventually go to war with Japan and that we would find ourselves island hopping across the Pacific, which meant we would be involved in amphibious warfare, attacking from the sea. My father, at this time, was an intelligence officer in the Marine Corps, and he had gained intelligence that the Japanese were gonna make an amphibious landing north of Shanghai. So typical risk taker that he was, he commandeered a tugboat. He put the American flag on the back because we were at that time uh, legitimately neutral. And he sailed right into the middle of the invasion fleet. Bullets flying all over the place, shore batteries firing on them. Uh, the, the captain of the tugboat was wounded, but there's my dad out on the forecastle with his box camera taking pictures of this invasion. And something that really amazed him, because he looked at the landing craft, and the landing craft of the Japanese were literally running right up onto the beach. A ramp would come down. The Japanese and all their equipment would be disgorged out of this landing craft. The ramp would come back up and they'd back right off the beach. Well, the United States had nothing like that. Our amphibious craft were basically whale boats and they could get as close to the beach without getting stuck and then people would jump over the side. So he's taking pictures and he's making sketches and he goes back to his office in Shanghai and he writes a massive report on what he saw. And he waits until the pictures are developed and he puts it all together and he sends it back to Washington DC to the Bureau of Ships saying this can solve our problem of amphibious warfare. He hears nothing, the sound of silence. Two years pass. 1939, he gets ordered back to the United States of America. He goes back to the US. He's now, if you could take a look at him, he was not a happy man at that point in time. So he goes back and what does he do? Beeline, still the first lieutenant, beeline to the Bureau of Navy ships. And he wants to know where his paper is. And he's searching and searching. And finally, they take him down to the bowels of this building and in a file cabinet, he pulls it open and there's his report. And across the top of it, it said, submitted by some nut in China. <laughs> submitted by some nut in China. What do you think he does? The brute, okay? He's a first lieutenant in the Marine Corps. He decides he's gonna go see the commandant who's a four-star general. You know, that's not the smartest thing that the lieutenant does, but he goes, to, he goes to see the commandant and he tells the story of what he found. The commandant, obviously very interested because we were gonna be involved in, in uh, 
this kind of warfare, the amphibious warfare. So he says to my father, I want you to go find somebody who builds a craft that looks something like this. And we don't have Google search back then. <laughs> he had to figure out how he was going to do that. And so he started searching around. And he didn't have to go too far from where we are right now because he went to New Orleans and he ran into a man by the name of Andrew Jackson Higgins. And Andrew Jackson Higgins was like my dad, crazy as a hoot owl, visionary, risk taker. And he goes to Higgins and Higgins built bayou boats that had very low draft and had a kind of a sloped bow. And he goes to Higgins and he says, here's a picture and here's a sketch. Can you build this boat? And Higgins said, yes, I can. And my father said, well, you got a very short period of time because we're going to have a competition. And the person who wins that competition is going to make probably 100,000 of these. Well, I'll tell you, old Higgins, he lit up like a light bulb. And he says, I'm going to make it. The trouble is, Higgins only had his savings account to go to. And he went into it and he withdrew all of his money, $1,500. And he built a boat, and that boat competed, and it was called the Higgins Boat, or the Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. And there it is. Read what it says underneath that. This is Dwight David Eisenhower. It's the Supreme Commander. The Higgins Boat won the war for America. That boat won the war for America. That's what the president, and at that time, a general who led American forces during World War II. Why did it win the war, you're asking? Because not a single offensive action, whether it was in the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, or the Pacific, did not start with an amphibious landing. And without that boat, it wouldn't have taken place. Talk about vision, talk about risk taken, personal, talk about reputational risk that paid off in strategic manner. You never know what you can do, gang. You never know what you can do in taking a risk. In 1946, the same man took, the, he was a teacher, he was a professor at the Marine Corps schools at Quantico, Virginia. And he put that slide, that very one, up on a screen. And he challenged his students, a bunch of Marine officers, and he said, take a look at that. Imagine elevating that boat above the ground by 500 feet and increasing its speed 10 times and call it a helicopter, what would that do for war fighting in America? No longer would you have to attack directly into the face of the enemy. You could use vertical envelopment to get around to their flanks and their rear. Now understand, at that time, the helicopter was in its infancy. I mean, it was a rickety death machine. They literally, I mean, you go on a helicopter, you might as well, it's a 50-50 chance you're even going to live. It could carry maybe one person. So my dad is tasked, find somebody who can build a helicopter. And once again, he goes into his famous Google search and comes up with a guy by the name of Igor Sikorsky. Igor Sikorsky, who built what are basically called whirly birds in his day. And my father went to him and said, I need to, you to do this. This is what we're going to do. We're going to build a helicopter. It's going to carry 12 combat-laden troops, and it's going to fly 150 or 200 miles away uh, an hour. And uh, people said, well, at best, that's risky. At worst, it's insanity. But he said, I'm going to try to make it. But first, I'm going to give you a prototype. And so he built this rickety old prototype. And after he said he had it built, 
My father said, bring it down to Quantico, Virginia, where there was an airfield. And he got a hold of the commandant, and he said, okay, I want you to bring all the senior officers in the Marine Corps down here to see the future. And sure enough, they all came down there, and they heard this wop, 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 this, and they saw this rickety old helicopter coming around the bend of a hangar. Suspended from the helicopter was my father. <laughs> and the whole idea of this, now, now all the students know why I'm so crazy, right? <laughs> Suspended from the helicopter was my father. And the rationale behind it was that he wanted to prove that it was safe. I mean, he's willing to get underneath the thing and fly around. We all ought to be able to get in front of it and get into it and utilize it for vertical envelopment. And believe it or not, the first time we had vertical envelopment was during the Korean War, and then you all know it came later. Look at that. Look at that. That was Vietnam, and they only got more and more and bigger and bigger as the world's wars progressed. Again, the idea of risk-taking of being willing to use your mind, to take that mind and say, you know, I'm not gonna let anybody stop it. I'm not gonna let anybody stop who I am. I'm not gonna let anybody define me. I'm gonna define myself and I'm gonna do great things. Let's fast forward to 1995 and an SOB became the Commandant of the Marine Corps. In this instance, the SOB stood for son of brute. <laughs> the world had changed dramatically. The fall of the Berlin Wall signaled the end of a bipolar world. A vacuum was created when the Soviet Union fell apart, and we began to see the, the growth of non-state and non-state actors. The conflicts in Panama and Somalia in Chechnya were the precursor to what we know now as a world of chaos. Unfortunately, at that time, uh, the overwhelming victory of the U.S. and coalition forces during Desert Storm gave the armed forces of the United States, certainly, and certainly others in, in around the world, a false sense of security believing that our military might would serve as a deterrent to anyone wishing us or the free world ill. Now, prior to becoming Commandant, I was the commanding general of something called the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. It was where future warfare doctrine and concepts were developed and tested. And for some time, I was very concerned that our nation was preparing to fight the son of Desert Storm instead of the stepchild of Somalia. That we're preparing for yesterday's war instead of tomorrow's. And that caused me to think long and hard about the following. That the view that we had, now understand this was 23 years ago, that the view that we had of warfare was inadequate. And my rationale was that, first off, there was a, a remarkable shift of the economic power within the world. It was no longer focused in Europe, but it was moving rapidly into the Far East, China, Japan, Indonesia, Singapore, all of this power and the focus was moving in that direction. For the first time, we saw massive cultural and religious strife taking place. It was a precursor of what we're seeing right now, but it wasn't understood then. People weren't even thinking about it. They were thinking about fighting Desert Storm again. But this was there. Certainly the rise of the non-state and the non-state actor which was going to prove to be deadly to us 20 years later. The rapid change in weapons and technology, oh my goodness, the, 
the weapon systems that were being developed that were with pinpoint accuracy, the overhead systems that allowed you to see, you know, the color of somebody's eyes from 500 miles up. That was making a big difference. And the trouble was it's accessible to all the players. Anybody who had petrodollars, they could buy it. The CNN effect. A lot of you were probably still fairly young during Desert Storm. Some of you may not have even been born, but they started showing pictures, newsreel, news camera photos of the accuracy of our weapons, the Tomahawk missiles that could literally be pinpointed to a window and go in and knock them out. That demonstration of our power forced our enemies into asymmetric warfare. Asymmetric warfare is when your enemy uses his strength against your weakness. And our weakness was the dependency on armor, our dependency on our artillery, our dependency on overhead capability, technology. And the enemy said, we're going to not let you have that. And we're going to bring you into close terrain. We're going to bring you into the cities. We're going to bring you into the, uh, the small uh, villages. In Bosnia, they brought you into the woods, and they negated your capability. And then finally, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Now, you and I think about weapons of mass destruction in terms of nuclear, because that's what's in the headlines right now. But the threat is far more than that. You know, when, when in 19, I guess it was 94, we saw the sarin gas attack in the London subway that just wiped out hundreds of people. We had the anthrax scare where people were getting uh, envelopes filled with white powder. So all of this was going on, and we looked at that, and I'm saying, what, what's the world going to look like in 2010? And we came up with the concept of the three-block war. We thought this is what it was going to look like. It was a war where you had a Marine or a soldier or sailor or airman who at one moment in time has got a child wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's taking care of that child or he's feeding people who are hungry or he's giving them medical attention. And it was called humanitarian assistance. And then a short while later, that same Marine would be keeping two warring factions apart. And it was called peacekeeping. And then just a short while later, that same Marine would be engaged in highly lethal mid-intensity conflict. And what was different from anything we'd ever faced before is that this would take place either nearly simultaneously or within 12 hours, and it would happen within three city blocks. And it was deadly. So the, you began to think, okay, how are you going to fight that fight? How are you going to find young men and women prepared to fight in such a chaotic battlefield? We've been so used to set peace battles, and all of a sudden you're not going to fight that. There weren't going to be a lot of officers on the battlefield because you were using dispersed tactics. So the people who were running the fight were no older than you. They were 20, 21. They were lance corporals, corporals, and sergeants. And the decisions they made could have easily had a strategic impact on this nation if they did something stupid, if they did something bad, it could have a strategic impact. So you needed to not only have great thinking warriors, but you had to have men and women of character. They had to have a great value system. And so we're sitting there trying to wrestle through, where do you find these people? And this is what we were recruiting from. Generation X. God bless them. I mean to tell you, 
some great kids, great kids. Uh, that's what they look like. I mean, you go out there, they got their glasses, the tie-dye shirts, and man, they are moving and grooving. Great kids. The question was, can we get them to fight the three-block war? So we decided to do something very radical. And that was, we're going to build Marines for the 21st century. This was now 1995. And we said, we're going to build Marines for the 21st century. And we are going to change the Marine Corps. We're going to change the way we recruit. We're going to change the way we train. We're going to change the way our personnel system works. And we're going to change the way our leadership system works. And if you don't think that caused a lot of stress and strain within the Marine Corps that had a over a 200-year tradition of doing things, boom, this is the way you do it. And all of a sudden, this SOB gets up there and says, oh, we're going to fight. We're not going to work for next last year's war. We're going to fight the war 15 years from now. It was going to be recruiting, recruit training, cohesion, and sustainment. At this point in time, no service was meeting its recruiting goal. The DOD budget was in a free fall. Competition among the services was heated, and there was no room for making a mistake. So with this as a background, we had to understand, okay, the key to transformation is going to be found in recruiting the right kind of people out of Generation X. Men and women who would fight and win on the modern battlefield, but were at the same time people of character. So to figure out how we were going to do this, I brought into my office a bunch of psychiatrists and psychologists. And I said, tell me about Generation X. And this is what they said about them. They want to know the boundaries. Tell me the boundaries. What am I going to be responsible for? Give these little suckers a break in that boundary, and they'd sneak out, do whatever damage they wanted to do, sneak back in, looking sweet as can be. They're willing to be followers if at some time they could be leaders. They wanted to be easily recognizable as a group and as a team. They wanted to do something of value. And they believed something greater than themselves, religion or some other means, but they knew there was something up there. So I looked at that and I said, my gosh, I love that. Bring them on. Bring them on. And the psychiatrist and the psychologist said, yeah, you, you, you like them, but guess what? Those are also people in gangs. And that the the boundaries of the turf, their turf, their part of the city. They're willing to sell dime bags on the street corner if it's sometime they can distribute kilos. They want to be easily recognizable, and so they would call them, they wore what are called colors and tattoos, the trench coat mafia. They wanted to do something of value, but that value had to do with the greater power, and the greater power was the gang and the loyalty to that gang. So you gotta figure out how to separate that. After receiving this information, I called in a great marketing firm, and for those of the students who are interested in marketing, we know some of these people. It's in Atlanta, it's called J. Walter Thompson. Come by and see me. They are really good. I asked them to develop a series of commercials that would entice good generation Xers to join the Marine Corps. Again, a big rest. I gave the company two months to develop these commercials, and I gave them a bundle of money to do it. Two months to the day, in walks this group from J. Walter Thompson with the lead person about 24 years old. In his hand was a cassette. Now, I know most of the students don't know what a cassette is, but 
well, just think of it as a, a DVD, okay? <laughs> and, and he walks with a cassette. This kid, 24 years old, had probably never shaved in his life, okay? <laughs> and he sticks the cassette into the cassette player, and he showed the following. a rite of passage, a challenge to join the elite, and if you succeed, if you can master your fear, outsmart your enemy, and never yield even to yourself, you will be changed forever. The few, the proud, the marines. Okay, I'm sitting there dumbfounded. And I look at this 24-year-old kid and I said, you have got to be kidding me. I gave you millions of dollars and that's what you produced? Where are the tanks? Where are the airplanes? Where's the amphibious landing? I said, my God. I wouldn't join the Marine Corps if I saw that for all the tea in China. <laughs> and God bless him, this kid looked me in the eye and he said, General Krulak, we're not trying to recruit you. <laughs> because of that kid taking the risk and making that statement, he won me. He had that much confidence in what he'd done that he looks a four-star general in the eye and says, hey, I'm not trying to recruit you. We're trying to recruit Generation X. We put it on the TV. We flooded the TVs. We, we flooded theaters with a series just like that. For 48 months, we never missed recruiting goal. Never. It was phenomenal. So he gets these kids. And the next effort that we had to do was to attack recruit training. Because the concept was, in the total transformation, you recruited them, then you brought them in, you had to do something with recruit training that would lead to a well-educated young man or woman that's instilled with the core values of honor, courage, and commitment, and to be individuals of character. You, the students are beginning to get the picture. I'm into this character thing, right? That's why I keep on saying to you, be a man or a woman of character. But anyhow, uh, to do this, we had to extend recruit training and make it more difficult and more focused on leadership and building these men and women of character. Now, for years, the Marine Corps recruit training was 12 weeks long, and the syllabus was the same. It hadn't changed for years. We're proposing to move it to 14 weeks and totally change the curriculum. This meant that it was gonna cost a lot of money. 
Now, for those of you who think that the Commandant of the Marine Corps has the option to spend money willy-nilly, he doesn't. This required me to go in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee to get them to budget for what I wanted to do. I had to convince them. So my wife and I, God bless her, we started hosting breakfasts for the Senate Armed Services Committee, for the House Armed Services Committee. We'd get them in there, and I would give them the spiel. And I would try to convince them that this was something that was critical, that it may not look it today, but the day after tomorrow, the wisdom of it would be proved. And they basically said, okay, you can, you can get our blessing, but we're not, you're going to go before the Congress. You're not going to get it just from us. You've got to go to the appropriators, the Appropriations Committee, the House Appropriations Committee, and the Senate. So back up on the hill, testifying in front of these people, and finally, finally, they said yes. And at that point, you need to understand, we entered the reputational risk phase. That, this was the real reputational risk. The Marine Corps was moving in the total opposite direction of the other services. Instead of relaxing standards, we were tightening them up. Instead of it having dual standards for men and for women, we established a single standard for all Marines. Hopefully the risk is obvious to you, the reputational risk, and there was literally a strategic risk. We get this wrong, and the Marine Corps is in deep trouble. This is a little bit of the comparison of what we did. The physical training was increased, running was increased, marching, that's, that's hiking. Physical fitness tests, you could see men and women were the same, increased the drill. All of that was, was, was okay, but what really counted are those two bullets at the bottom. 100 extra hours for the drill instructor. If you were a Marine recruit, that's the worst news you've ever heard. <laughs> that's the last thing you want, is for the DI to have more time to play with you. Except this time it wasn't play. This time it was focused on developing men and women of character. This time it was focused on the three-block war and what they were have to do and how they were going to have to fight. And then the final little one word down there was a root canal for all of them. It's called the crucible. It was a defining moment for any recruit. It was a gut check. We found that in dealing with Generation X, a lot of them had never really had a defining moment, never really had to go all out. And this was all out. This is 54 straight hours of food and sleep deprivation, multiple obstacles that they had to negotiate, and they couldn't negotiate it by themselves. They could only do it as a team. And if you didn't complete the crucible, if you fell out, you were washed out of the Marine Corps, and it was your 14th week, and you're out. The next aspect was called cohesion. This required to change the entire personnel system of the Marine Corps. What we believed is that you were not going to be able to fight in this 21st century war without having tremendous sense of who's around you, who's on your left and who's on your right, and can you trust them? Do they have your back? And so we decided to change the personnel system in the Marine Corps so that every single individual who went through boot camp when they graduated, would go as a lump sum to their specialty school, and from that specialty school, go in a lump sum to join their unit, and they would stay with that unit for four years. Think about tens of thousands of Marines coming through each year. Think about trying to establish school seats for electro-optics repair people, for administrative people, for intelligence people, for cannoneers, for tankers, how to get all of that together so that when they all graduated, they joined their unit as one and that they stayed with them. 
and the power that comes from that. All of my athletes here, all of the people that are on in the, uh, the theater and do things that work together as a team understand what I'm talking about, that at some point in time, it all gels for you. Finally, you had to sustain it. You couldn't take these crucible marines, bring them into the new commands, and continue to give them leadership and attention necessary. You had to continue that. You had to maintain their core values. The end result of this massive effort that literally turned the Marine Corps on its head was this, except it's not Generation X anymore. And it's not even Generation Y. It's you all. They're still wearing the same glasses. God bless them. <laughs> but I want to tell you, they're great young men and women. They're fighting our nation's battle. They're fighting the three-block war. They're doing it with honor. They're no me lies here. They're not killing innocents because that strategic corporal knows how to lead knows what it means to be a man or a woman, a character. Look at that young guy, holy mackerel, he's good looking. <laughs> Fast forward to 1 January 2001 when I became the chairman and chief executive officer of MBNA Europe Bank Limited. Although it's a typical financial institution, it focused mainly on consumer finance and credit cards. At the time I took over as the chairman and CEO, the bank was a small institution trying to get a foothold in the United Kingdom. It had difficulties because it was basically an American bank and I was trying to hook and jab with the big guys, Barclays Bank, HSBC, Royal Bank of Scotland, and a lot of other ones. So I thought maybe we could gain some momentum here if we use a tactic that was being used in the United States, and that was the use of the affinity card, which is nothing more than a card with a picture on the front that ties into an institution that the card holder happens to like. In the US, that began with colleges. That began with colleges, and the first affinity card made in the US was for Georgetown University. They had a picture of Georgetown, and they provided that card to members of the alumni and student body. This is how an affinity card works, because it's pretty simple. The issuing bank, in this case my bank, makes a deal with an organization to use the image of that organization. And for that, I give them a flat fee. I then turn around and say, as the issuing bank, I'm going to give your organization a small sliver of the profit of every swipe that that card makes. And you can use it any way you want. It can help your endowment. It can help your operating budget. You know, you can pay for faculty salaries. You can pay sports equipment. You can pay for anything. The organization gives the bank, MBNA, my bank, names. Names of customers. And they give you marketing dollars. And it turns out to be a win-win. So I assume the CEO ship of the bank, and I say, okay, we're going to move into the affinity marketing place. And we got nothing but a not so fast. It doesn't work here. It doesn't work here. It's, uh, it's not something that people in Europe do. It's certainly not something that people in England do. And, you know, there are only two colleges in, of any note. Of course, everybody knows this in England, right? So we're not going to do it. And I said, well, wait a minute. Let's think a little bit differently. Let's look at what is the largest sport in the world, soccer. And where is it really popular? England. So I said, what if we approached the premiership clubs in England and made them this deal. What if we went to some of the not-for-profit organizations in England and made them such a deal? So we authorized my marketing folks 
to take a chunk of money and to spend it on building a program that would convince the owners of the premiership clubs and clubs in England and in Europe that a partnership would be advantageous both monetarily and for building loyalty in their fan base. When we got the plan together, we went at it hard. And you're looking, I then turned into a, a, a salesperson, and I went to every single CEO and owner of every single premiership club and championship club in England. And I showed them their mock-up, and I gave them the business plan and said, this is something you've got to do. And by golly, they did it. And there's just four of about 90. That's my club, Aston Villa, in the upper left. Any Villa fans here? <laughs> Any Villa fans here? <laughs> hey! Okay, there's Arsenal, uh, Manchester United in the lower right, Barcelona, FC Barcelona. So we moved into Spain, moved into Germany, went into charities, World Wildlife Federation, National Trust, Breakthrough Breast Cancer. In a matter of two years, in a matter of two years, we went to the number one credit card in Ireland, the number one credit card in Scotland, the number two credit card in England, second only to Barclays, the number one in Spain, the number one in Canada, all because we took a risk. We did something that they said, hey, it doesn't work here. It doesn't work here. Instead of looking at what was an American focus, you looked at what are they do? what's the other culture doing? And the other culture was absolutely bonkers over the game of football, better known as soccer. Finally, I want to talk to, about entrepreneurship here at BSC and the opportunity to take a risk and reap significant rewards. RISE 3 is an extraordinary initiative that we have started here at BSC. As most of you know, it stands for Research, Internship, and Service. I want the students to listen to this. A couple of years ago, Hart & Associates, a well-known research firm, went out to the Fortune 500 companies and asked them, what are you seeking in college graduates? The first answer they gave was ethical men and women because they realized that if you had somebody that did something unethical, that would damage your reputation, that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. So they're looking for ethical men and women. Secondly, they're looking for critical thinkers. Hello. Sounds like, uh, yeah, that's right, critical, th critical thinking. <laughs> able to write effectively, able to speak effectively, and they want that graduate to have coupled their education with real world experiences, experiential learning. With RISE 3, BSC now covers all bases. Why is RISE 3 important to you? Why is RISE 3 important to an entrepreneur? Because you really cannot take a calculated risk without understanding the market. It's called research. You can't take a calculated risk without taking time to understand the enterprise. That's called going out and getting internships. And you can't take a calculated risk without realizing the impact of your idea on the greater community. And that has to do with service learning. We know what potential employers are looking for. They're anxious for the same things. RISE 3 exists on this campus. I'm encouraging the students, take advantage of this. I know it's new, and I know it's, you know, it's, it's kind of amorphous out there, and you're trying to figure out what it is. Talk to your 
professors. Get involved in this. The completion of a RISE three experience will end up on your academic record. It will be described as to what it is, what you did. It will be a remarkable asset on your CV, on your resume. Is it gonna take time? Yes. Is it gonna take effort? Yes. But there's very little in life that doesn't take time and a little bit of effort. I'll leave you with, with one final thought. And that is, and I'll go back to it, the idea of risk. You won't live a happy life if you don't take a risk. You really won't. Even when you take a risk, you get your heart broken every once in a while. Not everything's gonna work the way you want. But oh my goodness, the fun of when you do take the risk and you'll win, you succeed. It's the risk and the joy of meeting your goal that really brings joy to your life. And it also will enable you to do what I desperately hope you do. And that is that you will live a life of significance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for questions. If anybody has any questions, and you know my background, so it can be anything. It doesn't have to be on what I just talked about. If you have any questions uh, about anything I've done in my life, which is pretty crazy life, uh, my wife is here. She's the uh, truth teller, so if I start going too far off, she'll step up and raise the BS flag. <laughs> any questions? Any questions here? Come on, you cowards. <laughs> yes, sir. And I'll repeat them so you'll be here. General, what's your greatest failure in your career? That's a great question. And the question is, what's my greatest failure? And I will, I'll take it beyond career and take it into life. And uh, I, I don't know if my wife has ever heard me say this. My greatest failure is to not pay close enough attention to my children and to my wife. And that uh, early in my career, uh, I became way too focused on Chuck Krulak and not enough on Zandy and Todd and David. And uh, when you don't do that, you can't recover it. And always in the back of their minds, there are the times when you weren't there that you should have been there. And uh, you, that, that wears on you. And so uh, I used to tell, once I figured that out in my own head, I used to tell my Marine officers that sooner or later, the Marine Corps is gonna break your heart. Sooner or later, the Corps will break your heart and you will have to retire. Sooner or later, Birmingham Southern College will break your heart and you'll have to retire. If during the time that you're living that life in the college or in the Marine Corps, you've shown, not just in words, but in actions, how much your spouse means to you or your friends mean to you or what have you, then when the heart gets broken, I could reach beside myself and Zandy was right there and we literally walked off the parade deck hand in hand. If you don't do that, you may look to your left one day for your spouse, and that spouse may be there physically, but they're not gonna be there emotionally. So when you make the commitment, make sure you understand where your priorities lie. What else, what else? Yes, Jim.
Okay, the question. The question is, uh, where do I think we stand with respects to ethics and character within our country today, and then the point that it has to come from somewhere? I think that uh, you know it's very hard right now for me to answer that question because I'm surrounded by my precious students. And you know, I love them to death. And I mean, they are men and women of character and they're, they're, they're not necessarily finished products, but who is, right? Who is, we're gonna get finished. But I would say that as a nation, we're probably not where we should be. And that's the fault of a lot of people. As many of you know, I've been involved in politics a lot and I've, I've served with three presidents. And at the end of the day, uh, a lot of our moral compass comes not just from the churches and from the families, but also comes from our leadership. And so <clears throat> as long as the leaders are focused on doing the right things, Lots of people focus on doing things right. I'm not interested in anybody who does things right. I'm interested in doing right things. And so as long as we're focused on doing right things, I think we're successful. It's when we get off kilter that we lose something. And so I think that, uh, as I've said many times before, as I look out into the audience, the students I see, are gonna be the leaders and the thinkers of this nation for the better part of the rest of this century. So for the professors and the staff and people like us on the board, pay attention to these kids. They're gonna be leading this nation into the 22nd century and that's really important. So whatever we can do and whatever in our own little bailiwick, whatever we can do to help them understand how important their value systems are, the better off we're gonna be. Yes, sir. What significant adjustment did you make in your approach to leadership going from military to corporate to education? The question was what changes in leadership style did I bring to from the military to the corporate to the uh, education and and I think the answer is I didn't change at all I mean <laughs> this is it gang this is it don't be disport, discouraged but this is it uh, I didn't know squat about banking absolutely nothing for those of you who who wonder whether I had a 800 pound brain I had a pea brain I didn't know anything I didn't know anything about Academia, nothing. But I did know that I had a heart for people, and I did know that if you honestly care, that people will respond. And so for the people that were, were on the, what's called the President's Council, my you know, the Vice President of the college, and they'll, many of them will remember me bringing them together the very first day. We brought them into a big room, and I sat them down, and I said, I'm General Krulak. Each one of you have forgotten more about being an administrator of a college than I know. So I'm gonna need your help and I'm gonna need it desperately. And the, you know, if you, if you admit your, your shortcomings, in my case, <laughs> if you admit your shortcomings, uh, you know, you, you don't change. You know, what, what works for you at one time is probably gonna work just about any situation. Just try to be as, as honest and as genuine as you can be. And if you do that, I think people are gonna, gonna follow you. It's when you start trying to be a, you know, something that you aren't. I am what I am. What you see is what you get. I'm not, I, I curse a little bit. My wife doesn't like that. I, you know, I, my, my grammar probably not the greatest, but that's who I am. And people understand that. Yes. Okay, the question was, you know, what's on, and it's not mine, it's my wife and I's agenda. Uh, I think everybody knows I'm d 
deeply, deeply concerned about modern day slavery, human trafficking. And so I'm going to spend a lot of time with that. I'm deeply concerned about uh, the defense of this nation. So I'm going to spend a lot of time with that. I still have a lot of contacts in Washington, D.C. I'm going to be involved in that. I am absolutely going to be involved in Birmingham Southern College. I'm going to be a president emeritus. I've got an office uh, with Neil Birdie. The two of us are going to be working to do something very special, we believe, for the school, and that is to start to restore the endowment that uh, has been decreasing and trying to get uh, financial stability to the school. But I'm going to I'm going to keep busy. You're going to the poor old. Uh, basketball team, the volleyball team, the women's soccer team, they're all going to be very, very, they, they think they've gotten rid of me, the penalties, the bench penalties, the charges I take on the bench, you know, those are all not going away, gang. <laughs> yes, ma'am. No, absolutely not. Oh, my God. The question was, is it ever too late to be an entrepreneur? Absolutely not. I mean, it's, it's, everybody wonders, is it the idea? The idea is important. The risk-taking, the willingness to take the risk is the most important thing. Uh, you'll get the idea. There's so many things that are happening out there. It's just, are you willing to take the risk? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's a great question. The question is, you know, being in the military, uh, there's always this idea of, you know, when when do you stop dialogue and when do you commit forces? Uh, you would be shocked. The people who hate combat the most are the military. So I am very, very, very much for taking dialogue just as far as you can. When the time comes that it cannot go any further, you put your foot on their throat and you crush them. You do not go in light, you go in heavy. Colin Powell had the right doctrine. Get it done and get it done quickly and then have an end game that can get you back out. And unfortunately, we've, we've not done that and we found ourselves involved in, in almost uh, uh, quicksand in multiple times. But no, you want to use as much of, of the dialogue as you can. Uh, there are five elements of national power. One of them is military. That's a big one. Another big one is diplomatic. Then there's what you and I would call economic power. We've seen that exercise in Iran. Then there is right here the brain power. It's the think tanks, it's academia, and then there's the media. And if you use all those elements of national power, particularly the last four, you can, for the most part, avoid the, the first one. Anybody else? Yeah, right there. Yeah. The question is, what advice would you give to graduating seniors who are uh, excited but <laughs> terrified? Uh, I, I'm, I will tell you, I'm going to reserve a lot of that for a very short talk to the seniors at graduation. But, but what I was going to encourage is, you know, the, the idea of having other people define you. The idea of other people limiting you, saying, you know, you can't do this or you can't do that. Or, I know a thousand of you heard me say this many, many times, but I can remember uh, growing up and my dad and mom would always say, hey, Chuck, daggone it, the sky's the limit, the sky's the limit. And I thought long and hard about that. And then I started looking at you all and I said, hey, the sky's not the limit because there are footprints on the moon. And if there are footprints on the moon, you can do anything you want, you put your mind to. 
And I think that what your challenge is going to be is graduating from here in finding that niche, that place where you really have a passion for. And it's nothing wrong with graduating from here, going to one job, spending a year at that and saying, mm, nope, and start looking for another. And you keep on doing that until you find the one that's right. It's the right fit. And then you pour your heart and soul into it. At each place that you're working, you give it 110%. You never slack off. But if it isn't your passion or if it's not fitting that spot in your heart, don't be afraid to seek other employment. Yes, ma'am. I, I think that um, there are a couple of things that I wouldn't do, and I think I've shared this with a lot of my seniors, but I hope the juniors and sophomores and freshmen know this too, because, you know, I'm, I'm on the board of several fairly large corporations. Uh, one of them that I, I was just at is Union Pacific Railroad, and I'm really in, in interested in who we're hiring. Obviously, I spent a lot of time worrying about who we're hiring, and so, I was down at uh, a hiring session that was taking place at Union Pacific, and it, I was um, really surprised, but pleased when I went in and there was uh, the hiring official sitting to the right, and next to that hiring official was another individual from HR, and then the candidate was sitting across the table. And the, the uh, hiring official was here, the other official, from HR had two computers right in front of her. And as the candidate sat down and they started talking, uh, the woman stuck one of the computers over to the individual and it was already open and ready to go and she said, and I quote, friend me. Friend me. And all of a sudden, the person either said, okay, or they thought back, and what's on that page? What's on that page? Be real careful because that computer can cause you real problems. It can be a help and it can be a hinder. Uh, so for all of you who are about ready to go out and get jobs, screen your computers, <laughs> screen your Facebook page. I'd hate to see what mine looked like right now, but uh, uh, I, I, think, I think that technology is a great help. You can use it. Uh, I'm one of those people, I, 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 everybody who comes in who, and I do counsel a lot of the seniors and they come to me and say, how about this? And understand that when you do your resume and you stick it and you send it by email, it's going in with another thousand plus. If you really want a particular job, one thing that may be impressive to people is to take that resume in your hand and walk down there and try to get in to see the hiring official. And even if you don't get to the person that can make the hire, you give it to them, you give it to the person that's at the table or at the desk and you say, I'm Chuck Krulak, I'm really interested in this job. I drove all the way from Birmingham, Alabama to stand here in front of you and tell you, you got a thousand people who put their names in the hat, but I'm the only one here. Don't be afraid to take that kind of risk. What, uh, what do we got? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the question was, there, in her opinion, there are times in life when you give up uh, secondary goals in order to achieve uh, a greater goal and wanted to know when in my life uh, I've ever done that. And I'm trying to think. My wife is shaking her head. She says, this guy's too crazy. I'm, a, I'm like a raven on a roadkill. I mean, I don't... 
if I've set, uh, if I set a goal, I'm going to try my very best to meet that goal. I, I don't, I, I try not to prioritize them. Of course, there are things you do prioritize in life, but I never, never take my eye off and say, I'm going to give up one for the other. I just, I, I try to, one, I try to manage my goals. I don't want a million balls up in the air. You can't do that. So you, you limit what you want to do. I never looked, I never thought I was going to be a four-star general, never in a million years. My whole goal was to be a first lieutenant, you know, and then my goal was to be a captain and then a major. I saw it very, very, and this is a good thought for you, make your goals within your horizon. Keep your goals within your horizon. Martin Luther King said it perfectly. You know, he said, keep your eyes on the prize. He didn't say that the prize was 20 years from now. That prize could have been two days from now. Figure out what your short-term goal is and make that goal. And then you pick the next one and you make that. And before you know it, uh, you're at the top of the ladder. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, uh, the question is, uh, I, I mentioned growing the endowment in one year. It's not. It's going to. It's going to be a lot longer in one year. Uh, we need to get just round numbers. We need to get an endowment of anywhere between three and five hundred million dollars. Right now, our endowment's probably around 60 million. So it's got, we got a long way to go. Now, you weren't around when uh, Dr. Neil Birdie was the president. He was the president one, I guess, two before me. Uh, but he's a, a really remarkable individual. He's got a heart for this college like mine. And so uh, one of the people, anybody ever heard of Barber Sports, Barber Motor Motorway? Okay, well, Mr. Barber's a great friend of the college. And he's given Neil Birdie and I offices that adjoin each other. We actually broke a hole in the wall. And so our mission is going to be, instead of focusing just within the, the Birmingham area, we're going to go to foundations and to other organizations way external to the state of Alabama and start talking about this remarkable school, one of the 40 colleges that changed lives, and why our graduates are going to make such a difference to the nation. And we're, we can sell that, and we will sell it. But it's going to take time. But if you get that endowment up, then all of a sudden, the types of things that we'd like to do around this campus, I know everybody wants us to keep Maggie Daniels, but you know, hey, <laughs> What's this, a shaking head over there? <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you Would I establish goals for this generation as a whole? The overarching one that I've said many times, and that's to live a life of significance. Secondly, to make a major impact, not just on our city or our state, but on the country, to not be afraid to get involved into the political process, to if you have somebody, you know, if, if Hillary Clinton is somebody that you really respect, don't be afraid to, when, when they say we're going to have a Hillary Clinton for president chapter in Birmingham, don't be afraid to go down there, raise your hand and say, I'm here to volunteer, I'll do it for nothing. Uh, get involved in what's happening around this country that is like a cancer. I talked about uh, uh, human trafficking. You know, 150 years ago, we passed an amendment that abolished slavery. We have more slaves in this country right now than we had at any time prior to the passage of that amendment. You know, we have 200,000 children a year at risk taken off the streets out of the malls and you're never going to see them you're never going to see them you know that that milk carton with the face on the side 
that we used to think was just a runaway. And I, the first time I saw it was 25 years ago. And it was a six-year-old child. And I think about it now, and that six-year-old child is now 31, and she's been in a brothel for all of her life except for those six years. And she'll never get out. And we gotta, we gotta pay attention to that. It is the second largest illegal enterprise in the world, second only to the drug traffic, and it is growing faster than drug trafficking. It's worth $150 billion a year, of which two-thirds of it, or $100 million, or billion dollars, is tied up in sex trafficking. So if you don't think we got a problem, it's a problem. So, uh, you know, all I'm saying is find that thing that, that is important to you and pursue it. Any others? Yes, all the way in the back. Okay, I'm so, I didn't hear that. What is... I, 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 oh, what's the message I want you to spread to incoming freshmen? That's a great question. Uh, we're, we're, you're about ready to have a really neat class coming in. We've got, uh, as of uh, this afternoon, 251 have already deposited. That's some 90 above where we were last year at this time. They're great, they're great students, they're great student athletes, I mean, they're remarkable. And what you need to do is just what we did with cohesion and just what we did with the sustainment. You bring them into your heart, you hug them, you tell them what's right and what's wrong, you tell them not. People are gonna make mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes. You're eagles and you're gonna fly out of that nest and you're gonna flap your wings and you're gonna try to fly and a lot of you are gonna fly and some of you are gonna fall and bump your nose if you're a freshman. My message to them is they can get hurt. Don't let them get damaged. Don't let them get damaged. This week, one of our students got damaged. I know it's going to sound strange to you, but I feel like I, in some ways, let them down because I should have been able to do something to inspire that type of action not to take place. I know that's probably naive, but I want you to keep them from getting damaged. And the best way to do that is friend them, tell them what it is to be an honorable man or an honorable woman and how to live in our community. Okay, I know you all need to go study, gang. Daggone it. But thank you very much. We love you. Take care.